Hey, everyone. Joining me today for a really exciting interview. I cannot wait to talk to this guy is Sir Peter Beck. Peter is the founder and CEO of Rocket Lab. Peter, it is really great to have you. Congrats on all the success and thanks for taking the time today. Oh, my, my pleasure. So let's talk about 2024. What a huge year it was for you and everyone over at Rocket Lab. 16 rocket launches, if I'm not mistaken, a new record for the company. You're on track currently for record quarterly revenue. The stock for people who follow how it trades up almost 400% in the last 52 weeks. Peter, that's a lot of enthusiasm. What do you attribute that enthusiasm to? <laughs> yeah, no, well, thanks very much. Um, look, uh, it, it's, it's, it's all about execution, right? Um, uh, as you mentioned, execution on, on launch, but execution across our space systems uh, and, uh, and, and delivering uh, quarter after quarter as, as we said we would. So, um, yeah, look, I think it's, it's, it's down to execution. And, and um, I also think that, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of high, very high-profile space companies uh, in the world and uh, we just quietly and methodically go about doing our thing, and um, you know the, the delta between those 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 space companies is is starting to shrink, and uh, so I think that that uh, that that starts to get recognised over a period of time. You call yourself an end-to-end -end space company. First, for people who have heard of Rocket Lab but may not have had time to kind of look under the hood too much, what does that mean, Peter? And how is Rocket Lab positioning itself to be a, a even increasingly bigger player in the space economy? Yeah, no, great question. So I think most space companies you can look across and, and they're either a launch company, you know, they operate a rocket, um, or they're a satellite company um, where, they, where they have, you know, built satellites or they're an operator where they operate satellites. And I think the thing that makes us unique is that we do all of those things. So, um, you know, we design and build rockets, we launch them, we design and build satellites, we launch them, um, and we also operate satellites. So, you know, typically the industry is kind of bifurcated, if you will, trifurcated across three those three segments. Well, you know, a customer can come to us and say, actually, uh, you know, I want to do this thing in space and, you know, we can design the satellite, build the satellite, launch the satellite and operate the satellite. So that, that, that's very, very unique in this industry. So when you talk about a customer, um, appropriately, you and I are having this conversation today, at least when we're recording. This is Inauguration Day for Donald Trump's White House down in Washington. I'm, I'm sure you may have heard. I believe you've said before, Peter, your, your, uh, your customer base is about 50-50, 50% 50 yeah. government. 50% commercial, are you bullish on what the Trump administration means for Rocket Lab? And if so, why? Yeah, I am actually, because for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, there, there is a clear focus on, um, on defense and a clear focus on efficiency um, and getting the most out of, out of the taxpayer dollar for, for the nation. And, you know, on those two fronts, uh, th these, are, these are very important and strong areas for Rocket Lab. Um, you know, we, we are, you know, f fully commercial company. Um, we don't do the traditional defense contracting cost plus, cost plus kind of contracts. Um, so, you know, for, for us, uh, you know, if the government wants um, high value for, for, their, for their taxpayer dollar and, and you know, return an asset, then, uh, you know, that, that's, that's where our sweet spot is for us in our wheelhouse. So, you know, uh, no, we, we, we think this new administration will be very, very good for us. It'll be good for the space industry. It's very pro, very pro space, very pro defense. Um, and these are, you know, our two big sectors. What are the biggest catalysts and the potential landmines for 2025 for Rocket Lab? Yeah, well, for us, it's, it's really the year of Neutron. So, uh, so this year, you know, we're trying to get Neutron to the pad and launch successfully. Um, you know, that, that is consuming, you know, all the resources and all the mind share of everybody in the company right now. Um, and so so that, that, that's probably, the, you know, the biggest project within the company. But in saying that, you know, we have a number of, of you know, major satellite deliveries for customers as well. Um, the MDA Global Star satellites will be delivered this year. Um, this is a, an internet, uh, so, sorry, a, you know, direct to mobile constellation, um, as well as a number of, you know, other projects. And, you know, we're looking to, to, to do new things and, and grow into new areas. But, but look, you know, e everything is dwarfed by the giant rocket on the pad, that's for sure. When are you expecting the first launch for Neutron? It's been talked a lot about. Investors want to know. And uh, how much of the success this year and into next year do you think hinges on uh, Neutron compared to Electron or any of your previous launches? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the important thing to remember is two thirds of our revenue actually comes from space systems um, and not not launch itself. Now that that starts to change a bit when Neutron comes online, but you know the the you know the, the business is is um, you know tremendously under underpinned by a lot of the space system stuff. But you know we're looking to try and fly the uh, the Neutron vehicle by the middle of the year um, and uh, and you know get that 
that first successful flight. And then the following year we'll do another three flights and then following year another five. So um, that, that's kind of the, the walking into cadence that we're looking for. All right, middle of the year, we'll be watching it closely. Uh, there was a fascinating headline I saw this morning. This is just this morning, Peter. It's from the Molly Fool. And the headline says, Rocket Lab just might be the first company, the first space company, to figure out how to compete with SpaceX on price. How'd you do that, Peter? Well, look, I mean, we've always had to do that from day one. So this is this is not new news to us. Um, you know, we, we've always had to, you know, compete with, uh, with, with SpaceX and others, uh, quite frankly. And, um, you know, we, we are, a, you know, we, we are a fully, you know, commercially publicly traded company. So, so everything is, is laid bare to, you know, to, to see. And uh, it's, it's just been, you know, a, a, you know, a standard um, part of our reality that we our two biggest competitors are the two wealthiest people on this planet and have basically essentially infinite capital. So we can never outspend those guys. So we, we, we have to, um, you know, we, we have to find different ways. And, and typically that's through technology and, and, and innovation. And we've, we've been able to compete very strongly to date. I, you know, it's, it's not only infinite capital, but there is a presumed kind of coziness between those two business leaders and the incoming president. Again, you and I were having this conversation a short time ago, the inauguration more or less wrapped up on Capitol Hill. Impossible not to notice that Elon Musk of SpaceX is a few feet away from the president, that Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin seated just a few feet away from the president. Um, how do you view those those relationships as potential headwinds, if at all, for competitors like Rocket Lab? Yeah, look, I don't think that really there can be any funny business there. Um, look, uh, you know, and those those relationships, uh, you know, exist for a number of reasons. But um, when it comes, you know, to actually executing uh, programs to the, you know, to the to the, you know, the best efficiency of the taxpayers' dollar, I mean, ultimately that, um, you know, there, there can't be any fuss, funny business there, and we we don't ex expect there to be. Um, and uh, uh, so I think, uh, you know, I think, you know, for other reasons that might be important. But you know, as far as you know, competitive landscape for us. We don't really think that's an issue. Uh, SpaceX had 138 launches last calendar year, 2024, if I'm not mistaken. We mentioned you've had 16, but that's up significantly from where you were in previous years. The the sort of the, the pattern, the direction Rocket Lab is moving is, is increasing quite a lot. Mm. How do you view the market share of SpaceX or even a Blue Origin relative to where Rocket Lab is today? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of important things there. Um, you know, obviously, SpaceX have got a well, well you know, a well head start um, uh, on us, and and in a lot of respects, uh, you know, create a great bell wave that we we tuck in behind, which is which is awesome. Um, but uh, if if we actually look at the data, you know, the first to fifty flights, um, you know, you know, the, the speed from zero to the to, to fifty flights, Rocket Lab is actually faster than SpaceX to get there. And we think if we continue on our current cadence with Electron, we'll be first, you know, first to get to a hundred flights. Um, so, uh, yep, we, we're, we're, we're certainly tuck, tucking in, um, in, in behind, uh, you know, a, a great bow wave. But um, uh, if you look at the data, you know, the, we, we, we kind of do pretty well. So, you know, Neutron is obviously a, an important element for us and, and the, you know, the ramping of that f flight cadence will be, will be super important. But, um, you know, the, the, the one thing that is for sure and the one thing that I don't worry about at night is, um, is, is there enough market share uh, for all of us to go around? Um, you know, launch is hugely constrained. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as new launch vehicles come on, on to market and bring, you know, come to market along with their own, um, you know, really, you know, the availability of customers and, and, uh, and solving that launch crisis is, is, is something I don't worry about. Bit of a nerdy space question, if you don't mind. I've got lots of them. I'll try and limit them for the interview. I'll do the best. Uh, Please, do I the know, best. So I want to ask about your launch sites. Correct me if I'm wrong. You got one in New Zealand. That, yeah. That's home for you. And you also got one in Virginia. You got one here in the States, right? Correct. Which launches happen where and why? And I know a lot of space fans, they, they kind of gravitate to the history of Launchpad mm -hmm. 39B, Kennedy. Obviously, SpaceX is doing a lot of their launches there. Any interest in expanding those launch sites, I wonder? Yeah, well, so, I mean, right now we're pretty well served, right? Um, so the New Zealand launch sites are, pu are purely for electron launch vehicles. A neutron will never launch down in New Zealand. Uh, there's just, just not enough scale down here to be able to, you know, support that. But the New Zealand launch pad, um, you know, it's, it's very unique in the fact that it's, um, you know, one of only two privately owned launch pads in the world. Obviously, SpaceX has got Boca Chica. We've had, you know, Mahia Peninsula now for, for many, many years. But it gives us the ability to launch out um, sun synchronous and also mid inclination out of the one site, which is unusual. Uh, if you're in the States, if you want to wa launch sun synchronous, you have to go out of the west coast. If you want to go in you know, mid inclination, you have to go out of the east coast. 
And, you know, that, that's been part of the success of the electron vehicle is just having that, you know, just unfettered access to launch and, and, uh, and, and launch sites. Then the, the one in Wallops, you know, we, uh, it, it was a big decision point for us. Do we go to the Cape or do we go to Wallops? But, you know, the Cape's a pretty busy place. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a little bit impatient. I don't really want to have to get in line and wait, wait for my launch slot. So, um, you know, going down, to, uh, down the road a little bit to Wallops gave, gave us the ability to, to have, you know, a tremendous amount of access to orbit without having to get in, get in line behind the big boys. So, uh, so that, that is a, you know, it's a huge advantage for us um, down, at that, down at that launch site. Yep, it's a few degrees inclination less than what you can get out of the Cape, but uh, actually uh, for the majority of flights that, that really doesn't matter, but it does give us a, you know, a completely empty launch site to walk onto. Oh, that is fascinating perspective. As a lot of space fans, you know, you go to these places, Houston, wherever else, Johnson Space Center, and, and you just, you take in the history and you recognize why these places are important. It's yeah. awesome. And, and you sound yeah. like such a fan of the work. And I can tell that from your previous interviews and even as you tell here, right? Like at the end of the day, you just got to be, and I say this with all due respect, you got to be like the biggest space nerd going, right? You got to <laughs> love this stuff. And it sounds like you and your yeah. team really do to be able to compete the way that you have. Yeah, yeah, um, but but there's one thing that trumps that, and that's uh, good business. And um, and I think this is this is where Rocket Lab has been successful over others, is, is that the space industry attracts uh, a number of, of of really passionate people. I mean, this is this is one of the hardest things you can do. So you've got to be incredibly passionate about it. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, for us, business comes first, and uh, we, we make business decisions over over kind of passionate, you know, space geeky decisions uh, every day. And and uh, you know, the Wallops Island one was was it was a great example. I mean, I walked around the Cape, and and we had the op the opportunity to inhabit some amazing historic launch pads at the Cape. Um, and yeah, sure, half my brain is is like this is this is hello ground. This is the most amazing place to ever launch a rocket. Wouldn't it be cool to have a Rocket Lab logo here? But the other half of me is like, well, no, this is not a good business decision, and that half will always win. Yeah, that is fascinating context for someone in your position. So, th so thanks for letting me ask that because we don't get to hear that perspective a lot of space fans. Um, I want to ask you about the the Artemis missions. Now, you, you've already been involved in so far as the Capstone kind of lunar satellites. Mm. I wonder what more Rocket Lab might be doing for future Artemis missions. And any concerns about the delay schedule? That's a big thing for fans who follow the space closely here in the U.S. It's that we've got. Now Artemis 2 and Artemis 3, we keep kind of pushing those time horizons a little further and further out, and I wonder what that means for your company, if anything. Yeah, well, I think it'll be interesting to, to watch what the new administration wants to do here because, um, because you know, the Artemis program, while, you know, very successful in, in actually, you know, delivering what it needed to deliver for the first mission, um, you know, it, I, think, I think there's going to be a little bit of a, a you know, a, a, a scratch on the chin and a ponder about, well, are we going to the moon or are we going to Mars? Um, and what does is, what is the future of, you know, human spaceflight look like to these far off destinations? So it'll be interesting to see. You know, I think I think that cake's not not fully set yet. So it'll be interesting to see what the new administration's view is on um, you know on on Artemis and and you know human spaceflight to these 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 further destinations. So to that point, Elon Musk, of course, has very famously said the idea of being a multi-planetary species. It, it's necessary to survive. We want to go to the. We want to go to Mars. Do, do you agree with that? How possible is that? Or are you not too concerned with? that type of conversation right now? Well, look, I, th I think it's good for humanity to put a footprint on Mars. Um, uh, do I fully subscribe to the Plan B, um, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, objective, um, not so sure. But, I mean, I think uh, it's, it's hugely inspiring and lots of technology will be created that will benefit everybody down on Earth to put a footprint on Mars. So I think we should absolutely go and, uh, go and, go and do that. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's also a lot to learn throughout a solar system um, within the space sciences that can have a huge, huge benefit to humanity. Including the first private exploration of Venus. Peter, what a cool mission. What's the goal there? What should people who aren't familiar with those ambitions know about it? Yeah, well, I think Venus, Venus is a little bit of an, you know, an understudied planet in, in a lot of respects. And there is a, a certain altitude within the, the clouds of Venus where it's, it, it's, it's kind of possible that some kind of life could exist. Um, and, you know, our, our, our mission is to go and, and try and sample that cloud and you know, it's, it almost think of it as a go-no-go -no -go gauge for, for, for life in, those, in, the, in that region. And I think that's important for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, if you if you look at the the scientific evidence we have to date, um, there is we we have discovered no other life outside Earth. So, you know, if you want to be scientific about it, 
the only statement that we can make today that's true is that we are the only life in the universe. Um, now, I'm not sure that, that that will be true, but I mean, until we get evidence to prove otherwise, that's kind of a scientific fact. Um, if we could go to somewhere like Venus and actually find some form of life in the atmosphere, I think that says two things. What says, firstly, we are not the only life in the universe, and I think that's profound. Um, but also, if life can live in the clouds of Venus, then it's most likely prolific throughout the universe, which I think is another very profound thing. So, um, you know, for me personally, uh, you know, trying to answer some of those questions um, in my lifetime would be would be a wonderful thing to do. I don't know how often you get asked this. Do you personally think we're alone in the universe? No, I think I think statistically there's there's most likely other forms of life. Now, are they intelligent or otherwise? Who who really knows? But I mean, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm an engineer and a scientist, so I have to take the scientific method. And and if you if you follow that approach, that we have, like I say, we have no evidence to prove otherwise right now, and we really need to find that evidence. Yeah, the observable universe is enormous, and it certainly sounds like Rocket Lab is up to the enormity of those tasks to helping us understand it all a little bit better. I'm really grateful to your time. I love this interview. I hope our listeners do, too. That's Sir Peter Beck. He's the founder and CEO of Rocket Lab. Peter, thanks a lot for being here. Thanks so much.